Hey everyone, welcome back to Space But Mess here, and today we're going to be continuing our Astronomy Master's program for YouTube. Now in the last lesson we talked about how astronomy was one of the oldest sciences, but who were the actual people who developed it in ancient Greece and helped spread it through the rest of Europe and the rest of the world? That's this week on Space But Mess here. Now if you're new here, this video is part of a series called the Astronomy Master's Program for YouTube, where I teach you everything I learn in my Master's Program in Astronomy as I learn it. So if you'd like to start from the beginning or check out all the episodes, click here, here. Otherwise, please subscribe to be alerted when I post a new lesson. I always do that, it should be there. Now back in ancient Greece, before modern technological structures were built to measure the skies, careful observations had to be made and repeated over and over again to ensure their accuracy. Careful, repeatable observations also underlie modern science. Now, elements of modern science were therefore present in many early human cultures. It's natural. The path that led to modern science emerged from the ancient civilizations of the Mediterranean and the Middle East, especially from ancient Greece. But why does modern science trace its roots to the Greeks? Greece gradually rose as a power in the Middle East beginning around 800 BC and was well established by about 500 BC. Its geographical location placed it at a crossroads for travelers, merchants, and armies from Northern Africa, Asia, and Europe. And building on diverse ideas brought forth by the meeting of these many cultures, ancient Greek philosophers soon began their efforts to move human understanding of nature from the mythological to the rational. Now, Greek philosophers developed at least three major innovations that helped pave the way for modern science. First, they developed a tradition of trying to understand nature without relying on supernatural explanations and working communally to debate and challenge each other's ideas. Second, the Greeks used mathematics to give precision to their ideas, which allowed them to explore the implications of new ideas in much greater depth than would have otherwise been possible. And third, while much of their philosophical activity consisted of subtle debates grounded only in thought and was not really scientific in the modern sense, the Greeks also saw the power of reasoning from observations. They understood that an explanation could not be right if it disagreed with observed facts. Now, Greek philosophy first began to spread wildly with the conquests of Alexander the Great. Alexander had a deep interest in science, perhaps in part because Aristotle, who we'll touch on later, had been his personal tutor. Now, Alexander founded the city of Alexandria in Egypt, and his successors founded the renowned Library of Alexandria. And though it's sometimes difficult to distinguish fact from legend in stories about the great library, there is little doubt that it was one of the world's most prominent center of research, housing up to half a million books written on papyrus scrolls. So after that, as European civilizations fell into a period of intellectual decline known as the Dark Ages, scholars of the new religion of Islam sought knowledge of math and astronomy in hopes of better understanding the wisdom of Allah. Around AD 800, the Islamic leader Al-Mamun, or however you pronounce it, established a house of wisdom in Baghdad, where Islamic scholars, often working together with Jews and Christians, translated and thereby saved many ancient Greek works. These scholars were also in frequent contact with Hindu scholars from India, who in turn brought ideas and discoveries from China. So the intellectual center in Baghdad achieved a synthesis of surviving work of the ancient Greeks and that of the Indians and the Chinese. And using all these ideas as building blocks, scholars in the House of Wisdom developed the mathematics of algebra and many new instruments and techniques for astronomical observation. Now for this reason, many official star names come from Arabic. For example, the names of many bright stars begin with A-L or Al because it means the in Arabic. Okay, so let's go back to Greece in the beginning. We generally trace the origin of Greek science to the philosopher Thales. Now Thales is the first person known to have ever addressed the question what is the universe made of without resorting to supernatural explanations and phenomena? While he did think the Earth was flat, everyone back then thought he was crazy because he, he was wrong. Yeah, the Earth is not flat. A more sophisticated idea followed soon after, proposed by a student of Thales named Anaximander. Anaximander suggested that Earth floats in empty space surrounded by a sphere of stars and two separate rings along which the sun and moon travel. We therefore credit him with inventing the idea of the celestial sphere. But even he had his flaws. He thought the Earth was more cylindrical than spherical. Now we don't know precisely when the Greeks first began to recognize Earth as round, but this idea was taught as early as about 500 BC. 
by the famous mathematician Pythagoras. He and his followers may have adopted the spherical Earth in part because they considered a sphere to be geometrically perfect. Now, the idea of heavenly perfection became even more deeply ingrained in Greek philosophy after Plato asserted that all heavenly objects move in perfect circles at constant speeds and therefore must reside on huge spheres encircling Earth. Retrograde motion, or when a planet appears to move backwards in its orbit, proved that idea wrong, but his theories were still immensely valuable. However, a solution did come from Plato's colleague, Eudaxus, who created a model in which the sun, moon, and the planets each had their own spheres nested within several other spheres. Individually, the nested spheres turned in perfect circles. By carefully choosing the sizes and rotation axes and rotation speeds for all these invisible spheres, Eudaxus was able to make them work together in a way that reproduced many of the observed motions of the sun, moon, and planets of our sky. Now, this is how things stood when Aristotle arrived on the scene. In his model, all the spheres responsible for celestial motion were transparent and interconnected like the gears of a giant machine. Earth's position at the center was explained as a natural consequence of gravity. Now, Aristotle argued that gravity pulled heavy things toward the center of the universe and allowed lighter things to float towards the heavens, thereby causing all the dirt, rock, and water of the universe to collect at the center and form the spherical Earth. We know now that Aristotle was wrong by both gravity and Earth's location. However, largely because of his persuasive arguments for an Earth-centered universe, the geocentric view, as we call it, dominated Western thought for almost 2,000 years. Now, around the same time, Eratosthenes accurately measured the size of the Earth in 240 BC. He knew that the sun reached directly overhead in the city at noon on the summer solstice, but in Alexandria, it reached seven degrees from the zenith. And using basic math at the time, he guessed the circumference of the Earth was 42,000 kilometers around, super close to the actual circumference of about 40,000 kilometers. Now, all that being said, Greek modeling of the cosmos culminated in the work of Claudius Ptolemy. And while Ptolemy's model still placed Earth at the center of the universe, <laughs> it differed in significant ways from the nested spheres of Eudaxus and Aristotle. Now we refer to Ptolemy's geocentric model as the Ptolemaic model to distinguish it from earlier geocentric models. Now to explain the apparent retrograde motion of the planets, the Ptolemaic model held that each planet moved around Earth on a smaller circle, kind of like this, that turned on a larger circle. A planet following this circle upon circle motion would trace a loop as seen from Earth within the backward portion of the loop, mimicking the apparent retrograde motion. Now, even though this is all very wrong, it's extremely important. Ptolemy's great accomplishment was to adapt earlier ideas into a single system that agreed quite well with the astronomical observations available at the time. In the end, he created and published a model that could correctly forecast future planetary positions within a few degrees of arc, which is about the angular size of your hand held at arm's length against the sky. This was accurate enough to keep the model in use for the next 1500 years. Now, when Ptolemy's book describing the model was translated by Arabic scholars in around AD 800, they gave it the title Almagest derived from the words meaning the greatest work. Wow, that is all for how astronomy originated in ancient Greece. Thank you so much for joining. Next, we'll talk about the Copernican revolution or how the earth-centered model of the universe switched to the sun-centered model of the universe. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and I will see you in a couple days. Bye.